Hey, how you doing? So we finally finished making the crazy clock, and that means I can now cross it off the whiteboard. So we are done with that one now. So at the moment, the crazy clock is basically working as like a triple LFO or gate generator. But the aim is to have it drive another module, the sequencer, where I'm able to start making melody and rhythm once I integrate it into the machine. So that's what we're going to be looking at today, the logic and control of the sequencer. Now this is going to be one of the biggest modules I've made so far, and I want to show you the whole process as a tutorial type video, where you can hopefully build a sequencer of your own alongside me. Now the sequencer is going to have a lot of features and controls, so episode 3 is going to be split over quite a number of different videos, where we'll start and build up all the different elements and create a final module. But before we start getting into it, first I have to announce the winners of the Crazy Clock PCBs. I wanted to say thank you to absolutely everyone who commented on the video. There were some pretty bonkers ideas from absolutely all of you, but there can only be two winners, and these people are PS Visual Design and Doug Hankins. Congratulations to you both, and these PCBs will be coming into the mail to you before too long. As much as I loved everyone's ideas, a lot of commenters didn't have any contactable information in their YouTube about. But to those of you who didn't win, fear not. I'll upload the Gerber files to GitHub or somewhere like that. So that if you still want a crazy clock in your system, you can just upload the files to your PCV company of choice. And then you can still have the chance to make your very own crazy clock. So I'll leave a link in a pinned comment or the video description where you can find it. Alright, so let's get back to the sequencer. So the first question is, just what the hell is a sequencer or a sequence? Well in mathematical terms, a sequence is just an ordered set of numbers or items. So think of like the Fibonacci sequence or the values of pi. We could consider these a sequence of numbers. But a sequencer, in musical terms, is an electronic device that creates a sequence of control voltages that we can use to modulate the pitch on a voltage controlled oscillator. So you can see where the idea of rhythm and melody starts to come in. Now there is a lot of different sequences out there, from like a super simple baby 8 or to a more intermediate one like an M416 step. And then to the super advanced, like a Make Noise Renee. Intelligel Metropolis. But just what kind of sequencer are we going to make today? Well the plan is to create a hybrid between a Baby 8 and an MFOS 10 step sequencer, with a lot of extra features and controls along the way. Now another question you may have is, why make a sequencer when you just make melody with a keyboard? Well for a very simple reason. I can't play keys for shit. I know like one riff and it's like four notes. But another reason is because of this great quote by Brian Eno. The great benefit of computer sequences is that they remove the issue of skill and instead replace it with the issue of judgment. So all I basically have to do is just dial in the correct notes on the sequence until I create a pleasing melody. Rather than trying to teach myself how to play piano for months on end and probably still never be able to make anything good. All right. So now that we have a bit of an idea of what a sequencer is, let's go down to the breadboard zone and start making one. So when it comes to making a sequencer, there are a few ways we can go about it. We can either use an Arduino or some other kind of microcontroller and program in the functionality, or we can just use a bunch of specialized chips to create the functionality. Now I normally suck at coding. I can do it to get by, but it's really not my forte. Plus I think watching me tapping away at a keyboard isn't really going to be much fun compared to physically just playing around with some chips on a breadboard. So what we're going to use instead is just these to create our sequencer. So we can get rid of that. There's probably also other ways like using transistors or even relays, but I think that's probably getting a bit too far out there. So we'll just keep it relatively simple for ours. Now when it comes to using specialized chips, there's two ways we can go about it. We can either use a 4017 decade counter, or we can use a 4022 octal counter. But what the hell is this decade and octal business? Well it basically just means that the 4017 chip will count from 1 to 10 in sequence and the 4022 will count from 1 to 8 in sequence. Now if you're a musician or just have a basic idea of music composition, then you'll know that most music is written in a 4-4 time signature, meaning that every bar has 4 beats and those 4 beats are made up of quarter notes. 
So you get the one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Or if you count the end beats, you have one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and, and so on and so forth. But what exactly does this have to do with these chips? Well, the 47N counts from one to 10, which isn't really a four, four time signature. It's more like a five, four. There are ways to force it to a four, four, but what I think is going to be easier is to just use the 4022, which will count from one to eight and fits much more nicely with a 4-4 time signature. So how exactly are we going to use these 4022 chips to create a sequencer? Well, to give you a bit of an idea, here's one I prepared earlier. Now this thing is an absolute mess, so don't try to work out where any of the connections are being made, because at this stage, we just want to try and understand the kind of functionality that it has. So up in the top right corner here, we can see that I've just got a little basic clock circuit made from a triple five timer, which is being used to drive two separate sequencer circuits, which we can see is counting from one to eight in sequence, and then wrapping back around to the start when it finishes. But what's this cool looking seven segment display all about? Well, watch what happens when I flick this switch. Instead of this bottom sequencer counting from one to eight, we can now make it count from one to N. N? What do you mean by N? That's not a number. Don't be bringing algebra into this. Well, what I mean is that we can make it count from one to whatever number we want within the range of the sequencer. So we can see that it's counting from one to six on the LEDs with the number of steps on the seven segment display. But watch what happens when I move these wires up here. It's now set to four steps. So we can see the bottom one is counting from one to four. And if I move this one down, it's now counting from one to five. So that's what I mean by making it count from one to N. We can choose whichever number of steps we want in the sequence. So at the moment, it's just this bottom sequencer that has the one to N counting functionality. But in the end, this top one is also gonna have the exact same setup, but I just didn't have enough room on the breadboards to be able to create the exact same circuit twice. But another feature that I want to incorporate into the sequencer is to be able to use this bottom one to feed into this top one. So if I flick this back to eight steps, and now I move this wire, which is the clock for the top sequencer, over into the carry out of the first sequencer. So every time this bottom one finishes its sequence, it'll make the top one advance its count. And this will also happen when we use the one to end functionality. So every time the bottom one counts from one to five and finishes its count, it will advance the top sequencer. Now there's a couple of other little things in here like some reset circuitry for the 4022 chips. But I think rather than trying to explain how all of this is working in one go, what we should just do instead is pull this all apart, as much as it pains me to do. But then we can just take it from the very beginning and build up an idea of how I've gone the sequencer to this point. And then hopefully you'll be able to follow along and create the exact same kind of circuit as me. So I've moved inside because it started raining outside and was making a hell of a noise on the shed roof. So rather than trying to do noise reduction on that, we'll just move inside. So we've pulled apart the whole sequencer circuit, and the only thing we have left now is just the clock up in the top right corner. And I've just tidied it up a little bit and replaced the pod with this little trim one. Now we already know how this works, so we don't need to go through building this all over again. And then down the bottom here, I've just left in the LEDs to make the connections. And as you can see, I've also drawn up the pinout diagram for the 4022 chip. On the right hand side here, we have the power and ground connections to supply power to the chip. Then along the left hand side here, we first have our clock input, which is used to drive our outputs Q0 to Q7 in sequence, every time the clock pulse goes high. But why is it not Q1 to Q8? Well, it's just due to the nature of how digital logic works. Everything starts at zero, basically, which to this day, still catches me out sometimes. But we then have our carry out, which is a pin that goes high every time the count is finished. Then we have a few chip controls. First is the clock enable input, which is used to start or stop the count in the sequence. Then secondly, we have the reset input, which is used to reset the count back to the start. All right, so now that we have an idea of how the chip works, let's put it back into the breadboard and see it in action. All right, so I've wired up the 4022 to the indication LEDs, and then I've connected the control inputs to their appropriate positions. But if I apply some power to the circuit, we should hopefully start to see these LEDs lighting up in sequence. All right, let's make this a little bit faster. Nope, too fast. Perfect. So we can see that the LEDs are now counting from one to eight again, or zero to seven, whichever way you want to say it. 
Now you'll probably also notice that with these wires connecting to the LEDs, these are not in order at all. And this is just due to the internal connections in the chip. They're absolutely all over the place, so you have to pay attention to where they're going. But let's have a bit of a play around with these control signals and see what they do. So on pin 15 here, we have the reset. So if I connect this to the positive power rail, but every time it gets connected to the positive, it basically resets the count back to the start. And then over here on pin 13, we have the clock enable which means that if I connect this to the positive power rail, the count will stop at whichever step it's currently at. And again, because of the floating behavior, we get some weird results. This would be much better with an actual switch, but oh, I've got one here, let's use that. All right, so using this switch should stop the floating behavior. But if I flick this the other way, we'll see the count now advances again. And then when I flick it the other way, the count stops. Now since we've got the switch here, I'll show you how the reset works as well. So we can see that with the switch flicked this way, the count is allowed to advance. But if I flick the switch the other way, it'll reset the count back to the start. So this is how the reset pin is used. Now another cool thing that we can use this reset input for, is to use it to reset the count depending on which one of the steps it's actually made it to. It might be easier if I just plug in a wire and show you. But let's say we want the count to reset on, no, I'll say the fifth LED. So now you can see that every time it reaches the fifth step, it resets the count back to the start. But the problem is the reset happens so quick that we never actually see the fifth LED light up. So we have to move it across to the sixth LED to make it a five step sequence. And you can see that if I connect it to the very last output, then it never actually reaches the 8th step. It just stays as a 7 step sequence, until I bring the reset pin back low again. So at the moment, we've got an 8 step sequence. But what if we only wanted certain steps in the sequence? What if we wanted to remove steps, say, 3 and 5? So it'll still be an 8 step sequence, but just these outputs will never happen. Well, we can just pull the wire out. <laughs> so steps 3 and 5. So now we can see that they're never actually reached. Internally, the chip is always going to be counting from 1 to 8, but we can selectively choose which steps we want in the sequence. So in the final design, what will actually happen is that we'll have some switches, so that we can choose which steps in the sequence we actually want. And I could also make this, say, a 6 step sequence, and we'll take out the 4th step. So again, it's just never reached. Internally, the chip will count to the 4th step, but we just never see it on the indication LED. So with this idea of only jumping to certain steps in the sequence, let's draw a switch into our diagram. And of course I got the trusty Mr. Bean ruler. Now you're probably wondering what do these little parallel lines mean? Well it just indicates that there's 8 wires, instead of just one connection. So what it means is that we'll have 8 different switches, and that means I should also draw an LED in. So we've got our 8 switches and 8 LEDs drawn into the diagram, theoretically according to these little parallel lines. A lot of sequencer designs will have a rotary pot attached to the reset pin of the chip, and then each step on the pot is connected to a different output. So then we can use it to reset the count, depending on the step in the sequence. But I was trying to think of a cooler way to use the reset pin, and that's where I came up with the idea of using an 8 to 1 multiplexer chip. So what I'll do, is I'll draw the chip into our diagram, and then we can build up an idea of how it works. Alright, so I've just updated the diagram and drawn in the multiplexer chip, which is a 4051. And this will take 8 common inputs to 1 common output, depending on the state of these 3 control lines, or select lines. Depending on the position of these select lines, it will choose which one of the inputs comes to the common output. And these select lines follow a binary pattern. So if I quickly draw out the binary numbers from 0 to 7, then you'll get an idea of how it works. So what we'll have is 3 switches connected to the select lines, they can switch between 12 volts or ground. So 12 volts will produce a binary 1, and then connecting it to ground will produce a binary 0. So if we follow this binary pattern, then we'll be able to select which one of the 7 inputs comes to the common output. So rather than using a rotary pot, I'll just have 3 switches per sequencer to be able to select the step. Now there's a very specific reason that I've chosen to do it this way, and this is so that I can make use of the 7 segment display. So I've just been editing the footage from last night, and I just realised that I've completely muffed the binary patterns for the select lines on the chips. What we actually want is this one down here. 
But before we get to the 7 segment display, let's just wire in this 4051 chip and get an idea of how it works to reset the 4022. Alright, so I've wired in the 4051 8 to 1 multiplexer chip. So now if we plug in the power, we'll probably see that there'll be no sequence. Yep, yeah, as I expected. Because the select lines are set to zero. So if there's zero steps in the sequence, well there's zero steps in the sequence. Just realized I made a couple of mistakes with the actual pins for the select lines. The way it's connected on the chip is back to front to the way you'd expect it, but that doesn't matter. Point is, if I now move the select line down here, it creates one step. Well, it's still just one step, so it's not going to do anything. It's not until I move the second wire that we now get a two-step sequence. Then if we move the next one down, we now get a three-step sequence. Now we have four steps, five, six, and seven steps. But the problem is we never actually get an 8-step sequence using the multiplexer chip. Until I discovered something, over here on pin 6, I forgot that we actually have the inhibit line, which should normally just be connected to ground, rather than floating. And I should also probably draw this into our diagram. So when I first built this circuit, I actually discovered that when I move the inhibit line to the positive power rail, it's meant to turn off the multiplexer so that none of the inputs can actually go through to the output. But I think somehow it's disconnecting the reset line back to ground and creating an 8-step sequence. But it doesn't matter what the select lines are set to, as long as the multiplexer chip is turned off, oh, get in there. it'll always go to an 8-step sequence. Now I've actually noticed that there's a major flaw in our design of the diagram. Instead of having those reset connections coming through all the switches, what we want is this connection to come up directly into the outputs of the 4022 chip. We're not accidentally missing the reset step, and creating an 8 step sequence when it's meant to be say a 5 or a 7 step. So that way it's just bypassing the switches for the selective step capability. So another reason that I wanted to use this 4051 multiplexer chip is that I can actually use it to interface with the little 7 segment display. So if I quickly put this into the breadboard, I'll show you how it actually works. Alright, so I've just got the bottom half of this 7 segment display connected up to a few resistors and wires. Now this display is what is known as a common cathode, which means that all the individual LEDs in here have their cathodes tied together. So that means that for each individual LED, well that's the decimal point so we won't count that, <laughs> but for each individual LED, if we connect it to power, it'll light up a different segment. So depending on which segments we light up, we can actually choose which number we want to display. Now you're probably thinking, there's got to be a better way than just moving all these wires. Well yeah, there is. What we can use is a 4511 chip, which is what is known as a 7 segment driver. This chip will take 4 binary inputs, and then depending on the state of those inputs, we can then connect 7 outputs to the 7 inputs of our display. And then with some clever circuitry inside, it'll be able to work out, depending on the state of the binary number, which number to actually display on the little 7 segment display, rather than individually moving all these wires just to get the right number. But before we put this into the breadboard, let's quickly draw it into the diagram. Alright, so I've drawn up the diagram for the 4511 chip, and then the little 7 segment display. But we can first see our binary inputs. The first thing you'll notice is that S3 is connected directly to ground, and we'll get to this in a minute. But we can see that S2 to S0 is connected to S2 to S0 on the multiplexer chip. So this means for every binary combination that we produce on the chip, it will then subsequently display the correct number on our little 7 segment display. Now down the bottom here, we've also got a couple of control inputs. We first have the latch enable, which means that if this is connected to a binary 1, it will hold whatever number is on the display, regardless of whatever data is coming into the inputs but we always want the display to be updated whenever we make a change with the select lines, so we just tie it directly to ground. Then we have another control input called the lamp test, which means that it will turn on all of the LEDs at once. And then we have the opposite called the blanking test, which will turn them all off at once. Now I've also just noticed that I should probably draw in some current limiting resistors here as well, or else we'll blow the LEDs inside the display. Alright, so now that we have a bit of an idea of how the chip works, Let's get into the breadboard and stun see it in action. So I now have the 7 segment display and the 4511 driver chip installed into the breadboard. But if I now turn on the power, 
We can see that we have a zero step sequence. Now if I move it to one, we get a one on the display, but still nothing's happening. Move this here, we now get a two step sequence. And three, now four, five, six, and seven. Now if you remember from what I said earlier, we can actually move the inhibit line on the multiplexer chip to be turned off so that we now get an 8 step sequence. But the problem is, this is now not being reflected on the display. It's still saying it's got a 7 step sequence. But what we can actually do, is use this lamp test input of the 4511, and then force all the LEDs to be on at once. So if I move this wire here from positive to negative, we now see on the display that we have an 8, and it reflects the same as what's happening on the sequencer. But as you can see from these two lines just here, to be able to choose between an 8 step sequence, or 1 to end sequence, they basically have to do the opposite from one another. So to be able to choose between these two modes, we need a way to be able to change these connections so that they constantly do the opposite from one another. So what we actually want is to have a switch connected between 12 volts or ground, and then we're going to make two connections from the common pole of the switch. One of them will come into an inverter, and then the other line will stay exactly the same. So what this means is that when we flick the switch to 12 volts, this line will have a binary 1, but this line at the top, because of the inverter, it will then become a binary 0. And then when we flick the switch to ground, this line down here will be a binary 0, but because of the inverter, this line up here will now be a binary 1. So these two lines will just keep doing the opposite from each other. So let's get this wired into the breadboard and see how it works. So what I'm just putting in here is a 4049 hex inverter chip, which just has 6 inverters all in the same package, but we just want to use one for the time being. So we'll bring this over into the lamp test of the 4511. We'll take that wire out. And then we also want another connection to come over into an inverter. And then the output from the inverter is coming into the inhibit line of the multiplexer. So now if I plug in the power, we should easily be able to switch between the two different modes with the switch. Bingo. Now we can choose how many steps we want in the sequence. So we could have five steps, switch it back to eight steps, then make it four steps. So now we have a lot of different options in terms of how many steps we want in the sequence. So in a nutshell, this is basically how all the reset circuitry is working for the sequencer. And then the idea is to be able to copy this entire thing a second time to be able to make a second sequencer. Alright, so I've made a copy of the reset and control design for our sequencer, so that we can start and play around with the interaction between the two. Now if you remember from my last video, this was my original plan for the sequencer. So my plan for the sequencer is to make a combined 8 and 16 step into the one unit. So what I basically want is to have two rows of LEDs that indicate the sequence, but I want to be able to flick a button so that it goes through the top row, and then it comes down to the bottom row, comes up to the top, comes down to the bottom and I flick it back, and then there'll be two independent sequences again. But I had to play around with the cascade circuit, and excuse the crappy Instagram video, but you can see that it's got some interesting behaviour. You can see that the last LED in the first sequencer, and the first LED in the second sequencer, are held on, while each sequencer is waiting for the other to finish its count. Well, this kind of presents a few problems. This would mean that these steps in the sequence would be producing a constant tone, before it moves on to producing its own melody. I could then remove these steps permanently, but then it makes the 4022 work as a 6 step sequencer. So I could then use a 4017 to try and make up those extra steps. But then the biggest problem of all is that, when you look at the circuit schematic for cascade mode, there was a lot of connections that would have to be made, broken or rerouted to achieve a choice between independent sequences or cascaded sequences. And this honestly just seemed like way more trouble than what it was worth. So I figured I would use a better idea, one that's not quite as cool, but far simpler to implement. If you remember from earlier, I said that we can use the first sequence's carry out signal to feed into the second sequence's clock input. So this means that we can have the first sequencer making a melody, then when the melody is finished and wrapped back around to the start, it advances the count on the second sequencer. And this would mean that I could get a chord or tone behind the melody, which I honestly think is going to be way cooler in musical terms. So what that means on our diagram, is that over on the second sequencer, we want to have a switch coming into the clock input. And this switch can either flick between the actual clock, so that both of the sequences are receiving the same clock signal, and therefore they'll be working as independent sequences. 
but then the other choice on the switch is going to be the carry out from the first sequencer. So that's how simple it's going to be. All we need to do is just have a switch to be able to flick between the two different clock signals for our second sequencer, rather than trying to make and break so many different connections like the cascade mode. So now that we have an idea of how the second sequencer is going to be controlled by the first one, let's put it into the breadboard and see how they work together. Alright, so I've got the second sequencer just up the top here. Now if I move this wire from the second sequencer, from the clock input, over into the carry out of the first sequencer, we can see that when the first sequencer finishes its count, it'll advance the count of the second sequencer. So you can see how we'll be able to get a bit of a melody and then some chords or tones behind the melody. I don't have a switch, but so you'll just have to imagine, but then we'll just be able to flick it back over into the clock mode. Now another thing that you can see is that when both of the sequences are set to independent mode, they're actually not in synchronization with one another. So if I flick the bottom one back to eight step mode, what we actually want is for both of them to then fall back in synchronization with one another. So how exactly are we gonna be able to achieve this? Well, let's go back to our diagram and draw it in. So if we want both of the sequences to fall back in synchronization with one another, when they're both set back to eight step mode, then what we need to be able to do is to send a signal to the reset lines of the 4022 chips. So if we flick the switch to eight step mode, it'll mean that we have a binary one on the output of the inverter. So we can use this high output to trigger the reset of both of them. But the thing is, we don't want the reset to be held permanently on, or else the sequences would just be stuck at the first step and they wouldn't advance their count. So what we actually want to be able to do is to be able to create an RC reset circuit. So rather than just sending a straight reset signal, we can send a reset pulse. So that way both of them get a quick signal to say, you need to be reset back to the start, but don't hold that reset there forever. So how are we going to send this reset pulse to both of the sequences? Well, from the output of the inverters, we'll have another connection that will first go into a 1UF capacitor. So when we flick the switch to eight step mode, it'll produce the binary one on the output of the inverter, which will then quickly charge up this cap. And we then want a resistor to come down to ground. And this could be about 10 or 100K. We'll have a play around and work out what works best. So that means that the cap can then quickly discharge. So that means that if the cap is allowed to charge and discharge quickly, we can produce a very quick pulse. One that's long enough to be able to set a reset signal to both of the chips. And just for safe measure, we can also put a signal diode on the output of this RC circuit, just to ensure that only the positive excursions of the reset pulse are allowed to travel through. And since we're doing this for the first sequencer, we'll draw it into the second one as well. So now that we have an idea of how this reset pulse is going to work, let's put it into the breadboard and see it in action. So I've got the reset circuitry installed in the bottom down here, and then the outputs from the reset is then coming into the 4022 chips. But we can now see that when I flick the switch back to eight step mode, both of the sequences will then fall back in synchronization with one another. So that means that on 8-step mode, they can both have a melody that's in synchronization. So this is a really good way to be able to synchronize both of the sequences again. But another plan that I have is to actually replace these wires with switches, so that we can actually have a choice between putting the sequences back in synchronization with one another or not. So on our reset diagrams, rather than just having a straight connection, we'll just put a switch. So then we can selectively choose whether we want both of the sequences in synchronization with one another or not. Now the next thing that I think we should start to have a look at is how we can actually employ some voltage control over some of the controls for the chips. So we can see that there's a couple of things like the clock enable or the select lines for the multiplexer and the seven segment display driver, or even the reset into the 4022 chips. Now, since we're not using these clock enables on either of the 4022s, then what we can do is just draw in a little jack. So this means that we can plug in an external signal, say from one of the other clocks in the crazy clock, and use it to actually start and stop the count between the sequences, rather than just constantly looping from one to eight or whatever number we have it set to, we can get a bit more of a dynamic rhythm from it. And I'm also thinking for the reset, we can actually put in another switch. So then we can choose whether we want to use the eight step selection switch or an external signal to reset both of the 4022 chips. So we'll get rid of these lines and bring it back down again. I'm sorry, this is getting really bad, this diagram. By the end of the video, I'll redraw this whole thing up again so it actually looks nice and it's not just 
you know, higgledy piggledy and all over the place. So now we can have the choice between either externally resetting the 4022 chips or just using the eight step selection switch. Now the next bit of voltage control that I want to look at is how we can use the select lines on the 4051 and the 4511. What I'm thinking is that we can actually put a switch jack on these select lines, which means that when nothing is plugged into the jack, there will be a direct connection between the switches so that we can manually choose how many steps we want in the sequence. But then when we plug an external connection into the jack, it will break the connection between those manual switches and then the select line will only receive the external signal. Now I've actually got no idea how the hell I'm going to draw a switch jack, so I'm just going to draw a little black box instead. It's not the best schematic symbol in the world, but you get an idea of how it's going to work at least. Alright, so now that we have an idea of how we're going to employ voltage control over some of these chips, let's install a couple of jacks into the breadboard and go and interface it with the synth and see how we can use some external signals to interact with the functionality of the sequences. So I have the crazy clock signals going into some jacks and going into the sequences circuit so that we can use the crazy clock signals to interact with the voltage controlled functionality of the sequencer. So if I pulse the signal going into the switch jack of the sequencer, we can see that the number of steps changes. And you also notice that when the changeover between steps happens, on the very last step of the sequence, it'll actually send it into an 8 step sequence briefly. Which is probably just a little quirk of this sequencer now. But if I keep this as a 6 step sequence, and then pulse the green cable, we can see that it'll reset the sequence back to the start. And then if I now pulse our red cable, we can see the sequence starts and stops. And if I change it to the free running oscillator rather than the pulse, we can see a bit more of a dynamic rhythm from the sequence. So as you can see, when we set all of the clocks to their free running modes, we can get all kinds of crazy timing and dynamic rhythms from the sequencer. So this final circuit is going to be absolutely bonkers when we build up the entire thing and then we're able to employ voltage control over almost all the parameters. Alright, so we've built up some pretty cool functionality and control with our sequences circuit, but at the moment it's all just digital logic and doesn't actually make any sounds or noise. Yet. Once we can start and get some melody out of this thing, that's when it will start to really shine. So that's what we'll be focusing on next episode, the analog circuitry of the sequencer. Now I've also redrawn our circuit diagram, so if you've skipped my whole explanation and just want to build the damn thing, then make sure you use this one. Alright, that's enough for today's episode. I'll see you next time.